heard about PCR biosystems? There's quite a buzz about us. Hop on over to our website to find out more. Hello and welcome to this year's edition of Pint of Science brought to you by the University of Roehampton. My name is Dr. Falka Behrens. I'm your host for the evening. Um, we have three speakers and two exciting talks lined up for you today. Um, and I would like to give uh, you an introduction, to, first of all, to the University of Roehampton and then to the talks and the speakers. So, um, just to show those of you who don't know where we are, um, the University of, sort of Rockhampton is in southwest London. We are surrounded by plenty of parklands. Um, we are an amalgamation of uh, four colleges, and uh, all of us that you're going to see here work in Whitelands College. Uh, Whitelands College, a nice historic building, uh, Grade Two listed. Um, and a pretty nice place to work, particularly um, when we uh, sit out for, for lunch in front of the cafeteria with views of, of Richmond Park and uh, very close to the Wetland Centre. So um, to go over to today's proceedings, um, we have three speakers, Dr. Robert Bush, Dr. Adele Castabile and Enver Kalejade. Um, Robert is an immunologist uh, who will talk to us about vitamin D and its role for COVID-19. Is it a wonder drug? Is it overhyped? What is the relationship? And then um, Enver and Adeli will talk about seaweed and its potential as the new superfood. So with that, that's my introduction already over. Um, so I'll bring up Robert, um, good evening, and the floor is yours to um, to tell us about vitamin D and COVID-19. Thank you very much, Volker, um, and welcome to everyone who is who has taken time out of this uh, lovely Wednesday evening uh, to join us. So um, vitamin D has been in the news uh, recently, even as we have um, survived um, with or without uh, weathering uh, a COVID-19 infection, uh, the last um, lockdowns and the difficult year uh, that, we've, that we're just coming out of, we're hoping that vaccines will get us uh, out of lockdowns. And one question is what can um, uh, nutritional support do to help um, uh, our immune um, system uh, to cope uh, as best as possible um, uh, in the process. And vitamin D has been hyped in that respect. Uh, it's had a lot of uh, attention. I do some uh, test tube uh, work on the effects of vitamin D on some interesting corners of the immune system, which is partly funded uh, by uh, these MS charities. So I'll be talking uh, about this very, very briefly, but uh, I'm hoping uh, to give you a little bit of a background um, to this um, uh, today. So um, vitamin D um, has been known since the start of the 20th century really uh, as um, the active ingredient in things like cod liver oil and fresh milk to, um, uh, uh, to treat uh, and cure uh, the um, childhood bone malformation uh, called rickets, uh, also once known as the English disease because of its um, association with the dark satanic mills of the industrialization. Um, we find a vitamin D uh, in two molecular forms, uh, uh, ergosterol and dihydrocholesterol uh, in uh, plants and fungi and animals respectively, including ourselves. And if we are lucky enough to find ourselves in some sun-drenched 
uh, uh, part of the Mediterranean where we have uh, exposure to ultraviolet light, um, we are able to um, open uh, these steroid rings and create these uh, structures, which are the two forms of vitamin D, vitamin D2 and D3, uh, that we know about um, uh, ever since around the late 1930s. Um, I've marked here in red uh, some places where uh, these two molecules undergo interesting uh, additional chemical modifications to turn them into the active form of vitamin D uh, that is um, uh, that uh, that that ends up uh, having uh, all the benefits uh, that it does provide. And um, in order to get uh, this to work, to get this UV uh, light mediated conversion uh, of these precursors into the active forms of vitamin D, we need to uh, have some exposure to direct sunlight. Um, uh, and uh, depending on the season, we might uh, be able to do with just a few minutes or with half an hour per day. Um, if you are less uh, pasty faced than I am, you might need a little bit more time and you'll want exposure to a decent part uh, of the body. Um, sunscreen blocks this, so delay the application of sunscreen if you really want to get, uh, get the benefit during the summer months, uh, which is not to say that sunscreen isn't a good thing against immune uh, uh, skin, sorry, skin aging and uh, and skin cancer. Uh, obviously, we have to strike the right balance there. Uh, we can also uh, get um, vitamin D from dietary sources, um, which are shown on this lovely platter here, of which uh, oily fish is probably um, the, the biggest component uh, that you can easily have in your diet if you're not um, uh, if you're not uh, at the uh, uh, if, you're, if you're willing to, to take uh, fish in your diet. Cod liver oil was the original um, uh, treatment uh, for rickets um, discovered first in the early 20th century. Um, we are now asked to maintain somewhere between 10 and 15 micrograms uh, of daily intake, uh, which translates into uh, international units as shown here. Um, if we, uh, if you're still growing and need, you need uh, the, the bone support that vitamin D uh, uh, provides, um, uh, you may need more. If you um, are frail or elderly, uh, if you have a mostly indoor lifestyle, you may need to uh, take in a little bit more and uh, supplements can help with that. I'm not here to promote any particular brands. Now, uh, what is striking about this is that it's possible to measure vitamin D levels in the blood and figure out whether you've got enough or not. Um, and uh, the cutoffs are given here as uh, nanomolar concentrations. So you can be uh, either severely deficient to the level where you might have problems with your bone maintenance, um, and or you might be in a gray zone uh, where you might still uh, not quite have enough to support optimal immune function. And um, what makes um, this relevant to most of us is, is that in the UK, uh, we don't get enough sunlight uh, to meet our vitamin D production needs during the winter months. Um, and so in the UK, we're actually all uh, advised to supplement during the winter uh, or even year long if we have some of these other risk factors. Even so at the moment in the UK, Sorry, this, these are US data, but in the UK, um, the picture is qualitatively similar and maybe the numbers are a bit, uh, bit more. Um, but uh, overall, uh, we have a good proportion of the population who are either um, subclinically or clinically deficient. Um, if we have more highly pigmented skin, uh, that tends to be an additional risk factor uh, that increases the risk of these, um, of, of these problems occurring. So uh, if you are subclinically deficient, you probably won't uh, know this uh, without actually undertaking the blood test. Uh, there are no overt symptoms from this, um, but you're not getting the full benefit of what vitamin D normally does uh, to regulate the activity of our genes. So how does that work? Um, so this is, the, this is the general scheme. So we've, we've seen we've get, we get uh, vitamin D uh, from our dietary sources um, uh, or, from, uh, or in our UV exposed skin. We have then have these two uh, enzymatic modifications that happen in the liver and in the kidney uh, or in immune cells. Um, the 25-hydroxylated version is what you get in the blood measurements. And then 
uh, here you have the active form of vitamin D and it then acts very much like a steroid hormone. And like all these hormones, it binds to some receptor proteins in our cells, in the cells that respond to, the, to this particular um, um, uh, active um, molecule. And it, it, it binds and then this activates uh, this protein to sit down on uh, different uh, bits of our DNA, um, on particular uh, bits of DNA sequence, which then regulates the activity of our genes. And uh, that is um, then uh, pretty much how vitamin D changes um, how uh, the body functions. Now, it's difficult to be specific about this because there are so many different genes that are regulated in this fashion. Uh, but some of the major targets regulate the uptake of calcium from the diet uh, in the intestinal lining, um, the deposition of new bone and uh, its balance with the destruction of old bone uh, as part of our normal maintenance, and then uh, a lot of different aspects of immune function. And this is just uh, a molecular zoom in of the vitamin D with the vitamin D receptor protein uh, and with a second protein called the retinoic X receptor sitting on a piece of DNA where it binds in this fashion. And this changes the ability of uh, the neighboring genes uh, to make messenger RNA and therefore uh, to regulate uh, the activities of the cell and the proteins that it produces. And this is not an on-off switch. This is a subtle tuning of the activity of various genes in the immune system. And this is really just a snapshot of this from a review in 2008 that emphasizes the functions in the immune system. Uh, so vitamin D is pleiotropic, which just means it does all these things, um, a whole variety of things, and it acts on different cells in the immune system. Um, and uh, it does all sorts of things. And one thing to take away from this is it's not obviously just an immune boost or just an immune regulator. It does different things on different cells, some of which enhance um, the activity in fighting infection and, uh, and in some cases it dampens them. So one generalization is look first at what it does on these cells, T cells and B cells. So these are the carriers of what we call active immunity. It's what gives us memory, uh, uh, sorry, adaptive immunity. It gives us memory against uh, past infections. It gives us protection from vaccines. And in order to do that, you have to activate um, memory T and B cells. If you look at the arrows here, they show you that um, uh, vitamin D tends to reduce the activity of some of these defensive functions of the T cells and the B cells that provide this protective memory response. If you look here on the other side, here is an innate immune cell, a macrophage that is important in clearing uh, infectious agents that, if, that it has killed. And uh, this tends to get a boost from the activities of active vitamin D. Uh, this one is an interesting cell, a dendritic cell, which has a particular function in getting uh, the innate immune system, of which it is a part, to activate the adaptive immune system when that needs to kick in. Uh, so these are called dendritic cells. And um, I have um, done some research on studying uh, molecules that are particularly important in this activation process, uh, which are called MHC class two molecules. And you may not, you may or may not have heard of these uh, in the past. It's a somewhat arcane subject with a bad nomenclature. But the idea is this, you have T cells that need to be informed about the presence of an infection, and you have antigen presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, that have encountered the pathogen and that have therefore become activated. What they will then do is uh, they will take up the pathogen um, create fragments from its proteins and put these fragments in, uh, uh, into a binding site which sits on tissue antigens or HLA molecules or MHC molecules. All of this make, means the same thing and that just tells you how mad the immunological nomenclature is. Um, now, on T cells, you then have an, uh, a receptor which can pick up evidence uh, of this pathogen infection because it happens to match the shape of these protein fragments, and it can then trigger an adaptive immune response. And what makes these tissue antigens special is that when there is no infection, they also present protein fragments from uh, our normal 
uh, protein uh, makeup or proteome, and this helps the T cells to uh, distinguish self from non-self and to learn to become tolerant to self. So this is really important in diseases in which the immune system reacts against self or autoimmune diseases. And this is just a detailed molecular zoom in uh, on this interaction. So here is the MHC molecule, here is the tiny fragment from the pathogen, and here is the receptor on the T cell that sends the alert signal to get the immune response going. Now, when you look inside the antigen presenting cell, there's a whole other machinery, which I've devoted some of my career towards unpicking. So you have the MHC class, two molecules again here in light blue, presenting their peptides, and you might imagine the T cell here. The um, antigen presenting cell will have picked up um, the evidence of uh, pathogen, uh, antigen, um, from the outside world, engulfed it, and delivered enzymes into these compartments in order to create these protein fragments. And these MHC molecules pick those up. Now, the MHC molecules are delivered into these uh, endosomes, but then they have to do a certain amount of switching around their binding partners in order to pick up their peptides. One of the molecules involved in this is called HLA-DM, and one of our recent findings in the lab is that HLA-DM, the amount of this, uh, of this uh, exchange factor here uh, is regulated by uh, vitamin D. We didn't know this before. This is work in cell lines, which we need to follow up uh, and investigate more. Again, it's a subtle effect, as vitamin D effects generally are, but it's quite reproducible now, and, um, and we're thinking that it might affect uh, how uh, T cells get to see self and non-self and could have um, a role in the health benefits that vitamin D may or may not have. Now, if you take apart the immune system one cell and one molecule at a time, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, learn a lot about the immune system, but it's not really predictive of the actual health benefits. For this, you really need uh, clinical studies that look at, at uh, solid outcomes and typically randomized controlled trials or even meta-analyses. And um, when you're looking at the literature on vitamin D supplementation, you have a range of studies on a variety of different diseases um, that provide a varying level of support for the idea that vitamin D supplementation can help. It can certainly help with, um, uh, with uh, bone maintenance. Um, there is some evidence uh, that um, there is a causal relationship between low vitamin D and the development the risk of developing multiple sclerosis, whether that's a good target for treatment or prevention is another matter. Um, and then the jury is out a little bit more uh, on other autoimmune diseases and inflammatory disor disorders like type 2 diabetes, but also um, uh, respiratory infections and COVID-19 is on that list. Um, so one question is always when we look at uh, uh, association data, they're relatively easy to obtain. We take a bunch of people uh, with a particular condition like severe COVID or multiple sclerosis, and you ask, do they have lower vitamin D than the general population? And the answer often is yes. Whether that is a cause and effect relationship is an entirely different matter. And for that, we need uh, more sophisticated study designs. Now, in, in uh, multiple sclerosis, we have strong evidence, this is an immune disorder of the central nervous system. We have strong evidence um, that, uh, that low vitamin D is in fact um, a, a risk factor for developing um, uh, multiple sclerosis. And um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna be easy to supplement and prevent the disease, disease from developing or uh, getting better outcomes. Um, from supplementation, although that is now routinely recommended for patients with MS. But one reason we think it's causative is in fact because we have some genetic variation in the, in the enzymes that make vitamin D active or that later dispose of it when it's no longer needed. And um, the general story um, from these uh, genetic analyses is that genetic variation um, that makes vitamin D, uh, active vitamin D less available um, is a risk factor for developing MS, and that's something that you have um, uh, throughout your lifespan, and that probably is therefore a cause, and it can't really be an effect um, of, um, uh, uh, of, of the disease process itself. 
So in COVID-19, um, the, the, the balance of probability uh, is a little bit uh, the other way around. Um, it's a reasonable thing to think that vitamin D might regulate the overactive immune system that can cause damage in severe COVID. Um, and there's some clinical evidence that in um, uh, that at least in influenza infection, um, uh, you can get some benefits from uh, vitamin D supplementation, um, and that's about a twofold uh, risk reduction. So that uh, that's uh, a single clinical trial, but it's well controlled. It was done in a Japanese study. So it's not out of the question that vitamin D might have similar benefits in COVID-19. And indeed, we see um, low vitamin D in people who come down with severe COVID, uh, more than in the general population. Uh, it's a slight effect. It's not the best possible evidence. The main problem here is that, uh, is that um, we have all sorts of um, uh, other factors that might contribute to the severe COVID that are themselves associated with not having enough vitamin D. We've already seen that people with darker skin um, uh, who uh, end up uh, being at greater risk of bad uh, outcomes for possibly unrelated reasons also uh, tend to have more frequently a low level of vitamin D. If you are housebound or with underlying health conditions, you're more vulnerable with co uh, uh, for COVID uh, and you're also more likely not to get your daily dose of UV light. Um, if you are obese, you'll put away your vitamin D, which is a fat-soluble vitamin in your adipose tissue, uh, rather than having it in the bloodstream where it can act. So all of these things mean uh, that it's not necessarily clear that this is more than a correlation, that there is actually um, 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 a problem with immune defenses that comes from not having enough vitamin D and that makes COVID worse. Um, we nonetheless find that um, in the UK, our main uh, regulatory body, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, recommends people to take uh, vitamin D, um, primarily though, to maintain bone health, and especially because we're just coming out of a winter, we've been mostly housebound thanks to lockdown, and so it is recommended that people supplement uh, to make up for, for any deficits coming from this. But really, at the moment, the jury is still out on whether um, vitamin D protects against COVID-19 um, uh, as, a, as a real cause and effect relationship. So um, I uh, uh, hope that's been an interesting little vignette on, um, on what vitamin D can do. I'm certainly, um, I certainly would, would hope and uh, recommend if we can, um, that we can take a holiday here. Uh, I hope I've shown you that vitamin D has this interesting uh, intermediate status. It's not quite a hormone because it's dependent on the diet. It's not quite a vitamin because you can make it yourself. Um, you can get it, you can get a sufficient level from all these different measures uh, rather than a, a particular one. Um, I've taken you through a brief tour of uh, its effects on individual immune, immune components and activities. That's not necessarily able to tell uh, us whether it's any good as a health benefit. Uh, that's subject to separate studies. Um, and I hope that I've alerted you to the fact that this is a common, that, that a slight deficiency in vitamin D is quite a common thing in the UK, especially in the winter months, that it, uh, that it probably contributes as a causal factor to uh, autoimmune diseases, but that the jury is really out on COVID-19. Um, so, and certainly I would not suggest that anyone rely on vitamin D alone to get them through a pandemic. Do get vaccinated. I've got a little bit of a community outreach uh, project going in Roehampton on this. Um, and I will leave it there. And I look forward to the questions uh, that may or may not have come up in the chat. Thank you very much. And back to Volker. Thank you very much, Robert, for an interesting talk. So um, as Robert mentioned, if you have questions, pop them into the chat. We have a Q&A session at the end. Um, but for now, uh, let's continue with our second talk of the day by uh, Dr. Adelik Kostable and Enver Kalejade, who will bring us in on the secret ingredient from the ocean. So. Um, stage as if there were a stage virtual stage is yours <laughs> thank you volker and uh, good evening everyone and i'm very 
excited tonight, even if it's virtual, as Volker said, and glad to see all of you here. So I will start uh, the talk of tonight to just to give to you a brief uh, introduction about uh, this topic, and then Amber will tell you more about uh, this uh, secret ingredient that uh, we are currently studying at the University of Roehampton. So I will start to say that your immune system is quite important and uh, critical for uh, survival is uh, we have to say that must be constantly alert for monitoring or for sign of invasion or whatever is danger for your body. And what is uh, to say that the cells of your immune system are quite clever. They are able to distinguish self from non-self, but also they are able to discriminate between non-self molecules that are quite harmful, that are coming from pathogen, and the one that are more innocuous non-self molecules that are coming, for example, from different type of food. So I will say that your immune system protects our body from harmful invasion of pathogens, such as maybe viruses or parasites or bacteria. Now, uh, Robert already said before a few important points about uh, your innate immunity, uh, adaptive immunity. So I will say the first response to an invading pathogen is quite rapid, it's not specialized, it's uh, general, and is referring to the immunity that you are born. Then there is something that is more specific and is the ability to specifically recognize a pathogen remember it and maybe when your body will be exposed again. And the crossroad of this uh, bridging of communication between innate and adaptive immunity, we have very special molecules that are called cytokines. Cytokines are small molecules that are uh, uh, producing, let's say, from uh, many different uh, immune cells are quite important because are mediate your immune response that are also play an important role in the resolution of your immune responses. Let's say that they radiate out from cells such as a kind of a Wi-Fi signal that we need a lot nowadays. So uh, think about that your immune system can be uh, compared with uh, like a huge orchestra. And what's going on? When a pathogen enter, or uh, let's say harmful invader enter your body, all immune cells cytokines, organs, they are working together like a huge orchestra. The first cell of your immune system that is actually see the pathogen is the first one to be in contact with the pathogen is the director of this orchestra. And then that cell, tiny, will start to direct all other cells by forwarding messages, in that case are the cytokines, that are able to then respond as directed. Having so many cytokines in your body actually is not very good things. Look about this picture. It's like they can cause a kind of storm, so they can kill infection, they can protect your body, but when they are too many, as I said, it's not very good. So this happens maybe when too many pathogens, they can enter in your body at the same time, or maybe your immune system start to produce the wrong cytokine. So in that case, you can have some of these that are helping an inflammation of your body, so we call it the cytokine that are pro-inflammatory, and some others that are good, that are reducing. So in that case, we say more, um, more uh, helping your body to enhance health. Now, there are so many conditions that can trigger your immune response. Uh, before The talk before mentioned some of these uh, autoimmune disorders and immunodeficiency disorders, so I will not tell you more again, but maybe you, you know about antigen, so we call it something as a foreigner or harmful that actually can trigger your immune activity. Think about you go out, and uh, there is a lot of grass pollen, or there is dust, or there are small molecules that are coming from your food. 
One more important is like also an inflammation. And this is the normal step of your body innate immune response. So let's say a pathogen attack your health cells or your tissue, then start to produce so many proteins that then cause an inflammation. There, there are so many examples that I will show to you in the next slide that can actually depress our immune system. So here I list so many. Unfortunately, sometimes when we are getting older, that could depress our immune system, or there are so many environmental toxins, maybe you are overweight, there is a poor diet, and so on. Here we go. So we say nutrition is so important for your immune system. So actually it's very important to say because we are bombarded with so many news that we need appropriate nutrient supply, we need appropriate nutrient status storage of nutrients. And this because will help us to uh, have an appropriate immune function, but also a better defense against pathogen. Here there are so many. I just was thinking before to show to you something of that. I don't know if you heard that there are top 10 uh, food that are boosting your immune system. Actually, no, I'm gone. There are five. No, there are 20. Oh, more. So it looks like that we have so many food that actually can strengthen your immune system and they can help you to be more strong, to fight against something that is your invader, your harmful bacteria, maybe. So can we say really that does an immune boosting diet exist? Hmm, I, know, I don't know if I can convince tonight, maybe Amber later on can tell you more, but actually I will say, yes, there are, I'm sure in the audience, so many nutritionists that they can say, well, Adele is right tonight, because there are so many important uh, food that actually you eating enough nutrient as a part of a varied diet that can enhance health, they can, functioning better in your cells, but in particular also your immune cells. I will say that there are certain type of dietary patterns that are able to protect your body. So try to create a solid ground, especially uh, against microbes, or maybe when there is an excess of inflammation. I'm not sure if you see this slide about it well guide, but actually this is what I meant to say. So you need to have a very different type of food on your plate in order to uh, boost your immune system. And I will say that it's very unlikely that only one food will give to you a special protection. Now, so I will say that if there are so many uh, restriction diet nowadays, maybe you go to a very stream diet where you are lowering your nutrient, that is not very good things because you will have uh, something that will impact negatively on your health immune system. Think about your Western diet. I'm sure that you like it, but if you eat a lot of this junk food, it's not very good things because your gut will start to be so inflamed and then this will be associated with the switch off completely suppression of your immunity. So guess where 70% of our immune system is? I'm not sure, I'm sure that some of you know that. Uh, this is something that I'm very fascinated. I'm the gut expert that I tell you that uh, the gut is the major immune site of your immune activity. It's the site where there are so many antimicrobial protein there. So it's like a, an intricate uh, universe. Actually, it looks like a metropolis of trillion and trillion of bacteria called the macrobiome that is continuously adapted with our diet, lifestyle, and environment. So microbiome not only influences our response to different food, but also play a key role in immune function. So diet play an important role. We can feed our bacteria in the intestine. We can give them so many fiber, plant-rich diet, a lot of fruit, veggie, maybe legumes. And that will be a good thing because you are helping to grow and maintain. These are the good bacteria present in your body. Uh, sometimes uh, these bacteria are not very nasty to you. They can help you to maybe break down fiber and that will allow you 
to stimulate maybe immune cell activity. So it's quite important. But can we say actually that uh, diet can be used as a new therapy? I will say that uh, I will say that now Enver can tell you more. Maybe he can convince better you to say that you need to improve our health with the magic ingredient. Can wrap your uh, sushi maybe tonight? I don't know. Let's tell us. Enver. Thank, thank, thank you so thank much, Enver. So, much, so, so let's come let's to our secret ingredient. ingredient. So, seaweeds. At present, there are currently more than 10 different species of seaweeds are identified. These are divided into three categories, depending upon nutritional and chemical composition as rhodophyta, phytophyta, and chlorophyta, or simply as red, brown, and green seaweeds. So among these three types of seaweed, we are particularly interested today in brown seaweeds as they contain more bioactive components than green and red seaweeds. Out of nearly 2,000 breeding brown seaweed as species, Ascophyllum nodosum and Fucus vesiliopsis are the most studied species with the highest antioxidant values and highest total phenolic content. We recently published a review on molecules exploring the efficacy of the two brown seaweed species in the prevention of the metabolic syndrome, which is a term used for a collection of um, metabolic abnormalities that including conditions such as abdominal obesity, increased, increased blood pressure, increased fasting plasma glucose, increased triglycerides, and decrease of high-density high lipoproteins, basically HDL cholesterol, that lead to an increased risk of developing cardiovascular diseases, type 2 diabetes, and all kinds of mortality. In my next slides, I summarize the key findings from our review paper. Firstly, we are going to look at impacts of seaweed consumption on appetite and anthropometric indexes. Appetite is a mental feeling of hunger, satiety, satiation, and a desire to eat specific type of food and is one of the factors affecting calorie intake. When we are talking about appetite, there are two important hormones. These are ghrelin and leptin. While ghrelin greatens your appetite, leptin lessens your appetite. A diet rich in high fiber, that is, for example, coming from seaweeds, has been demonstrated to prolong the gastric emptying and thereby enhance satiety and reducing energy intake that will affect our body composition. With regards to the impacts of controlling blood glucose level, accumulating evidence shows that brown seaweed extracts inhibit carbohydrate hydrolyzing enzymes such as alpha amylase and alpha glucadase that involved in the digestion of carbohydrates. The inhibition of these enzymes has been shown to significantly reduce the postprandial increase of blood glucose, which means that when you get like carbohydrates after your meal, heavy carbide meal, by the inhibition of these enzymes, you can reduce the amount of blood glucose levels in your bloodstream, and that could be a potential way to manage blood glucose levels in type 2 diabetic patients and the borderline patients. When we look at the effects on blood lipids, consumption of brown seaweed extracts showing from our review paper, that is the summary of the 10 clinical trials in this field, has been shown to reduce total cholesterol, triglyceride, and LDL cholesterol, which is the common referred as a bad cholesterol, as high LDL levels leads to build up cholesterol in the arteries. On the other hand, Consumption of these brown seaweed extracts has been shown to increase HDL cholesterol, which is known as a good cholesterol, as it helps to remove other forms of cholesterol from your bloodstream. As Adele previously mentioned, among many factors that depress our immune system, expanded adipose tissue has been also reported to increase the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, including C-reactive protein, TNF-alpha, and interleukin-6. Fluoratanin rich extracts from brown seaweeds has been shown to possess anti-inflammatory properties as they have strong antioxidant effects. These antioxidants delay or inhibit cellular damage mainly through their free radical scavenging properties. Finally, gut microbiota plays a crucial role in maintaining intestinal homeostasis and improving metabolic health. A relationship has been documented between the gut dysbiosis, which is an imbalance of the gut microbiota composition and the development of obesity, insulin resistance, and other characteristics of the metabolic syndrome. To date, 
there isn't any clinical trial conducted that examining the effect of these brown seaweed extracts on gut microbiota composition. However, microbiota composition in high fat diet, mice supplemented with uh, dietary fucoid and isolated from the ascofolium nodosum for 16 week period showed an increase in the relative abundance of short chain fatty acids producing bacteria and attenuated the metabolic syndrome through reduced body weight, fasting blood glucose, hepatic steatitis, and systematic inflammation and reduced insulin resistance. If all that, that sounds interesting to you, you can be part of our research. So we are now recruiting volunteers to investigate the effect of these brown seaweed extracts on gut health, immunity, and metabolic disorders. If you are interested, please scan the QR code that is shown in the middle of the page. Uh, alternatively, we have provided our email addresses there. You can contact with us to get more information and to find out more. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Adelmi and Enver. Um, personally, really for giving me another reason to eat more sushi, but uh, also for an interesting talk. So um, bring back bring back Robert for um, the Q&A session. Um, so um, I had a scan of the chat and I will um, just throw in some questions that I think are interesting and ask our panelists to answer them. So uh, the first one's for Robert. I think here many effects of vitamin D seem to dampen an overactive adaptive immune system. Um, and you had a slide on, on that. Does that have any effect on the success of the vaccine for, for COVID-19? So the short answer is no, but I just, I, th thanks Laura for the question. Uh, if, if you could bring my slides back up for just a second. Uh, I just wanted to show what a nice pickup that was. Um, so you can see that um, if you're looking at the different components of the immune system, and I wish that Adele had actually spoken before me to make that brilliant introduction. Um, these are the adaptive immune cells. And, um, you know, they all become a little bit less um, uh, inflammatory if you look in um, test tube studies. Um, at the effect of vitamin D supplementation. So you might worry, can you do too much of a good thing with physiological levels of vitamin D? So it's not a bad question at all. Um, and I think this goes back to the idea that vitamin D uh, um, tunes the quantities uh, of these outputs rather than flipping a switch on and off. Um, and uh, as far as I'm aware, there's zero evidence uh, that vitamin D supplementation um, at the recommended levels uh, has any adverse impact on the vaccines. If it, if it did, uh, I think that would have been picked up in the clinical trials of the existing COVID-19 vaccines, which have shown a high degree of efficacy. Um, and given that the flip side of you know, some good proportion of, of, of us is, is, is subtly deficient in this vitamin. The flip side of that is that, uh, that plenty of us have sufficient vitamin D. So if, if there were a severe uh, depression of the immune system from having a sufficient vitamin D intake, um, you, would, you, wouldn't, uh, you, wouldn't, uh, you would have seen that in the clinical trials, I think. Uh, I could probably stop stop there, but um, uh, but I think uh, but I think it's it's an interesting uh, thing that nonetheless it seems uh, it seems that vitamin D sufficiency um, seems to be quite good at uh, preventing the immune system's inflammatory reactions to to over overdo it and cause excessive damage. Okay, um, perhaps follow on question to um, what I would call bioavailability. Um, of, of vitamin D. Is there a difference in the health benefits of vitamin D from food versus vitamin D we were made with the help of sunlight from, from other precursors? Um, I'd almost say that should probably be answered by a card carrying nutritionist. But as far as I'm concerned, when I see a chemical structure, it doesn't really uh, matter how it was synthesized. That's how chemists think about it. Um, and, and so that, that's one answer. The second answer, but thank, thank you, Adele. Um, the second answer is that, of course, the food sources also um, uh, um, 
had to make their own vitamin D with the influence of UV irradiation for that critical ring opening reaction that makes the active vitamin D from the inactive precursor. And so they've been through the same thing. Okay. He, he right. very well. he answered well. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, sort of, sort of, um, not in the chat, but sort of following on from from that, uh, linking linking it to seaweed. So the studies done so far have worked on seaweed extracts. Do you know that if people eat seaweed, if the same stuff kind of arrives in the body, is it as bioavailable, or is that something that where more research is needed? So, very good question. Thank you very much for that. So, two other studies that we're showing that then basically on humans are different, of course, like the the animals or like the in in, in vitro studies, basically. But so far, from the the ten clinical studies that in this done in field, it showed them um, the administration them like in a capsular format is effective than mm -hmm. like the eating. So as far as I know from the look at the data, but there is a still gaps in the literature that what is the optimal dosage it. And one of the aim of our study is to look at like the, the what is the best efficacy dose, like 300, 500, 700, because as you said, that how we metabolize it. So of course, different types of seaweeds as well. So we don't know the availability, but as far as I'm talking about this Ascofolumus focus vesicus species, I can tell that this 10 evidence is there is like effective, but we need to, a dose response study to clearly definite and also along with that how long should be administered in order to be so these are we trying to currently address these questions okay um that that just just a question popped up in the chat which is a very nice follow-on and probably impossible to answer uh, at this point of the study maybe would different kinds of seaweed have a different effect on your microbiota well i will say to casper maybe casper can join our study and <laughs> Tell you the truth, well, we don't know. There, is, there are few evidence that could be brown seaweeds that uh, they have a direct, direct effect on the microbiome, but there is a still a little bit of research to need to be done, so we cannot really answer to that question yet. Maybe in a couple of months, COVID permitted, hopefully, <laughs> and we can more update our, our study data. <laughs> okay. Um, just... Uh, scanning through, there's there's a, a kind of personal question. Um, oh, hang on, just jumped. There we go. Um, out of interest, do all of us uh, take vitamin D supplements? So obviously, you don't have to lay lay bare uh, your dietary habits, uh, but uh, it, it would be interesting to to know. Um, I don't, so I can I can say that that I don't. I probably probably should but given the amount of melanin in my skin i probably need about three rays of sunlight uh to to produce enough so um i do okay i do as well <laughs> i pay a little bit of attention to it and I, I i i do a bit of supplementation and also sort of watch my diet and getting out of the house a bit i think one of the one of the interesting things about about the lockdown advice has uh, has always been sort of, you know, uh, at the beginning, during the most severe stage of lockdown, it was stay the Dickens at home. And I think that might have given the wrong impression that that the virus was sort of floating around generally uh, widely in the environment uh, uh, and with people afraid to go outdoors. Now, outdoors is, is actually a relatively low risk environment for, environment, for, for infectious exposure. Uh, but I think... I think it's what it's one of these little things that we can do that it's good f that is good for our mental health that uh, happens to boost our vitamin D a bit if we uh, if we are out there long enough it uh, gives us a bit of exercise and it's sort of one of those uh, one of those uh, multifactorial things that are just going to be good for us in general um, and I, I think I think in that first stage of the lockdown which was the, the simplest advice that the government could give us that was slightly lost and I think it's a good idea to, to think about bringing that back if you've been shy about it yeah I think I think it comes back to to eat healthily even though no consensus uh, is, is 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 there based on based on what Adeli told us like there is like the 10 best things and I don't know whether there's an agreement eat healthily and and move around and during the first phase of lockdown uh, there was a no better better don't move if that means leaving the house um <laughs> bit of a uh, bit of a methody question almost uh from from Chris 
can the state of our immune system as a whole be measured or are we reliant on measuring individual uh, components of it and inferring from these so is there a standard marker if you've measured one thing here is our immune system or is it more a, a, a composite of, of other things i mean so it's a very interesting question thank you very much for chris for that so as a general inflammatory marker like general in the studies, we're looking at the C-reactive protein as a general markers of inflammation, but there are a lot of other pro-inflammatory and uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines. So it must be, we have to be very carefully and like we see like the whole pattern. So there is not like one definite answer, but it should be evaluated carefully, depend on like the whole blood lipid, basically the test of the cytokines. Mm. I would say that there are strong reasons to say it's never going to be a single measurement. Okay. Um, one, one, of, one of them is that, um, uh, that uh, we've already talked about this. It's possible to have too much of an immune response. Um, and indeed, inflammation in general, even when it's relatively mild, impairs the, the function of the tissue where it happens. It's actually one of the sort of classical hallmarks of inflammation that that, that is part of what it does. Um, the second thing is a, an immune system that has done its, its job it's an immune, is an immune system at rest. And so an immune system that, uh, an immune system is only ever tested for its, for its function when it gets activated. But actually when it's successfully cleared a pathogen, it goes back to rest. How are you going to capture that? And the last one is that there are different flavors of immune response, both in the innate and the adaptive immune response. You, make di you activate different cells and make different substance signaling substances, uh, producing a different inflammatory soup, so to speak. Um, you know, you can have your booyah base and you have your, your minestrone uh, fighting different pathogens. And I think that's another thing. You, your individual immune system can be great at fighting viruses and rotten at fighting worms or extracellular bacteria. Um, so, oh, uh, here's a question from um, Siobhan asking you uh, to, to get, off, or get off the fence that you nicely positioned yourself on with regards to uh, vitamin D and COVID. Um, do you think vitamin C, uh, vitamin D, sorry, deficiency uh, is a cause of or reason for worse COVID? Um, is this why different countries had different infection rates? Um, and uh, casting all scientific rigor aside, what's, what's your hunch? If you had to go yes, no, what would it be? Uh, to me, this is the sort of thing where it's better to endure the pain in your rear end and tolerate the fact that we don't know. Okay, right. Um, so, so what I will I will do, so uh, what? Okay, so so if I had to come down on one side or, or the other, I would say uh, there might be a marginal benefit of topping up your vitamin D in protection. Um, I think if there'd been a strong effect, we would have seen it by now. Um, I don't think it's going to hurt, and um, and uh, and I think Nice is pretty much spot on in, in its advice. So do take it. If you know, I mean, affording supplementation is not a huge uh, a, a huge ask uh, economically. Uh, it's a cheap intervention. It's going to support other aspects of your health, even if the COVID benefit is marginal or non-existent. But I do believe in in the uh, in getting the strongest possible evidence from the strongest possible study designs to answer that scientifically very valid question of does it actually provide a benefit uh, and for us to act accordingly. Um, and this is also why one of the last bits on, on my conclusion slide was do get vaccinated because it's, uh, I think again, if it had the level of efficacy uh, in protecting against COVID um, that uh, that sort of approaches anywhere near what the vaccines can do, um, we would have seen that by now. Okay, um, very nice question. Um, so, uh, come, just came in, 
our time is often spent in offices uh, or at home, which now double as our office, uh, within the hours of daylight. Um, is it perhaps that the modern lifestyle is in need of all of all? Are supplements enough to counteract the, the relatively unnatural way uh, we, we're now living or we are forced to live? More of a philosophical question. So whoever uh, wants to, to put their philosophy. So philosophers. it's kind of, again, like is like, I agree with definitely what Robert said, but I strongly suggest and advise basically what government advise on vitamin D, which is 10 micrograms a day. So this is like the, what the evidence is and the scientific advisory committee is like advising. And it's like the studies have shown that that have along with the COVID, it has other like health benefits as well. So I would advise everyone to get like 10 micrograms of vitamin D supplementation every day, even the summertime and the winter times throughout the year. Anyway, it cannot be worse. So uh, at least with the, that tiny amount, you can also help the bacteria present in your body. So overall, it's good for your health, no matter you are sitting for hours and hours in the office. So I would say take, always so effective. have something is better than nothing. So I will recommend to maybe in a couple of months, we can know better result with the COVID too. So, so okay. Bella, Bella, I quite, I quite like the, the, the question, um, and the, the short answer is there are all sorts of things in my own lifestyle that, that I think need a bit of an overhaul, and I've certainly put on a, a few pounds during lockdown, and uh, you know I've I've had sort of periods of time when my mental health has been a bit up and down, and, uh, and and so on. So I th I think I really buy into the idea of reflecting on on sort of the good and the bad of the the fact that some lifestyle changes have been imposed on us and now that we have a bit more flexibility we can think productively about what what we might do in general um uh, i um uh, i certainly have changed slightly what i'm doing in the sense that and i'm at the moment i'm working mostly from home i do commute in uh, uh and that's usually a bike ride and has been for many years but now I do that more during the daylight hours, and I'm only in the office when I need to be in the office um, and and interact with with live bodies. Um, so that has changed a little bit my my workday, and it puts my commute into the sunlight hours, uh, which which is perhaps a little bit of a tweak. But I don't think that specifically for vitamin D, it doesn't really matter which which mix of supplies you end up with. Um, so I think as a general question, it's, it, the question is well taken and, and reflecting on the question is perhaps the bet, a better answer than any of us can give. Uh, but for vitamin D, it doesn't really matter. Exactly. I think, I think it takes work. It's, it's sort of a behavioral change, isn't it? So we, we've, we've done the behavioral change of not having to commute, in, in my case, an hour each way. So uh, you, you kind of gain two hours, but if you spend those two hours not doing something useful, then then uh, those hours are not hours gained, and that that behavioural change, I think, is is the the tricky bit. Right. Um, so I think we're coming roughly to the end of our allotted hour. Um, thank you all very much for for taking part. First of all, the speakers um, and the audience for uh, for sending in questions. Robert, you had something. You, you wanted to say something? Oh, I, I just saw you. So, no, if, if you're wrapping up, it's just, I did have a seaweed question, if, if there's still time for one. No. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. <laughs> we'll, take that, we'll, take that, we'll take that off the air. That's fine. No, 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 I'm joking. Yeah. Go ahead. Go, go, go. Um, okay. So, uh, I was just wondering whether you've, um, so you've, you've sort of shown some interesting um, health effects uh, and a lot of those were metabolic. Yes. And uh, you mentioned uh, polyphenols, so I'm assuming that some of that is antioxidant activity, but I'm just wondering whether you've had specifically a chance to look at some, um, at some immune effects. Um, uh, in, in vitro, um, obviously, there are all sorts of indirect uh, consequences of the metabolic changes um, that might be anti-inflammatory systemically, but are there some direct effects on the immune system? So thank you very much for your Robert for your question. So um, what I can say at the moment from the available evidence is these studies are limited, and as you 
like I need to emphasize this one as well. Different studies have different population size. So most of the studies are done with obese people. Obese people has already has a like elevated uh, pro-inflammatory status. Uh, the, some studies they did in like the normal health groups, they st still see some reduction in the CRP level, which is the general marker of inflammation. But when it comes to some other studies, uh, this basically they see this directly like effect on the glucose levels. So the study is like the primary outcome uses gl glucose levels and type two diabetic patients. And as obese people, hyperinsulinic people, diabetic people has also altered immune response and they have already a uh, higher uh, pro-inflammatory status. So in order to answer this question, we need the studies that define like different population groups because for, in order to answer your question, there are studies diabetic people it reduces the inflammatory levels like pro-inflammatory levels and also it increases the anti-inflammatory parameters as their antioxidants but we need more study in different population groups because as i said there are either these studies performed on obese individuals or morbid obese individuals or diabetic individuals but we need more studies and also the, there are very lot of limitations in these studies because they are nearly accumulating evidences basically Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. That brought us nicely to just over the hour. Um, again, thank you all. Uh, thank you all for for contributing. Uh, thanks to the audience for for questions. And um, that's that's all I have. Um, I can say thank you. Stay safe, people. Get vaccinated when you get the chance. And um, take care. Thank you. And avoid this stuff. Get some sunshine. <laughs> <laughs>